I decided to make Aloha Summer be, be the story of the summer that led up to my character being incarcerated in the first place. Um, and so that became the mission of how to tell this story and to create a visual um, that, made, that made it feel like it was summertime and that people, when they saw the cover, would immediately go right to that place, wherever that imaginary place was, or this this fictional place was that I was trying to create on on the album through, through the skits. What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. As you all know, it's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it. Each one, teach one, and we appreciate your guys' support getting us this far. Now today on Cover Story, Master Ace is back. He wanted to do another one and he wanted to do a long, hot summer. So thank you for coming through, Master Ace. Glad to be back, man. I'm looking forward to talking about this. Yes. So A Long Hot Summer, this year, fifth LP, came out 2004 on M3. So now you're uh, on your own label uh, outright, I guess you would say. Um, and you've had major labels. You've had albums that got shelved. You've had a lot of success. You've had disappointment. So with Long Hot Summer, um, as you're getting into it and thinking about how to take to represent the cover, what were your initial thoughts and what were you thinking going into the project? So I, I wanted to, I knew I was going to tell a story about a summer and, and, and a specific summer. And the reason that I knew I wanted to do that, you have to go back to the, the previous album, Disposable Arts, because like it was on J Core Records and the album came out in, um, in, in October, I believe, of 2000 and uh one and three weeks after the album was released j Cole went out of business like they folded and so that album starts off the first skit is um me um um figuratively coming out of jail um it was more of a, a figurative t um nod uh it, it was really about me being out of music for five, six years. And now I was finally being released. And it wasn't really released from jail. It was released again, meaning putting music out. So I was just so disappointed that the, uh, that the distributor folded right after the album came out um, that I was determined to do another, because I was really proud of that record and I wanted people to hear it. And um, I said, if I'm gonna, I need to do another album to make sure that people know that this album existed. Because I figured if I did another album, I would do interviews and, and I would be able to tell people about this, people that didn't know that Disposable Arts existed. Um, and so my, my idea was to connect the two albums. So since, the, since Disposable Arts begins with me, this, this character coming out of figurative jail, I decided to make Aloha Summer be, be the story of the summer that led up to my character being incarcerated in the first place. Um, and so that became the mission of how to tell this story and to create a visual um, that, made, that made it feel like it was summertime and that people, when they saw the cover, would immediately go right to that place, wherever that imaginary place was, or this this fictional place was that I was trying to create on, on the album through, through the skits. Okay. And that it's interesting you say that because now thinking back to take a look around Slaughterhouse, uh, sitting on Chrome and Disposable Arts, the Disposable Arts and Long Hot Summer have the same font. Uh, whereas yeah. uh, Master, Master Ace, take a look around is different than sitting on Chrome and Slaughterhouse. So this is your third font, I guess. Well, so yeah. Yeah, uh, I fell in love with the the graphic, the logo that was created on Disposable Arts. 
I just thought that it it was just smart. It was clean. I'm actually wearing a shirt. I don't know if you can see it. It's too bright. Um, it was just the triangle. It was just like a clean font. It was like this. This looks like me going into the new millennium, the beginning of the 2000s. And so I knew that going forward from disposable, that was gonna that was gonna be my logo. That's the logo that I was gonna continue to use. I was I was kind of figuring it out on those other albums, like. I didn't really have a lot of input. It was more like art design or something like that. On first on the first album, you know, they just come up with a couple of different things and then boom. Um, and so yeah, I decided that I was gonna go forward with this as my logo from that point forward. Okay. And then as you did with take a look around and with disposable arts, you're sitting down on a, a long hot summer. Mm -hmm. So uh why did you decide to do that again on this album? Um again, um I we use the same process that we use for disposable. We just different photographer. Um, shout out to my guy Francois Benora, who's from who's from France. Um, he came out uh, to the states and shot those those photos for me. And he, I, I I knew that I wanted to be on a stoop. Um, I didn't know where uh, I wanted to do it. He was in New York. Uh, from France, he was staying at like a, it, it wasn't Airbnb at the time, but whatever, whatever it was, he was staying at a, at a, at a, a rental apartment in Harlem. And so he's like, well, listen, there's, there's a lot of cool stoops around here. Come on up to Harlem. We'll walk around the neighborhood. And so we walked around the neighborhood and we took pictures in a few different locations around Harlem. And, um, and I was sitting down. Um, um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't sitting down. It was just the pictures of the stoops. So he took a bunch of different pictures of stoops because those were going to be the backgrounds that were going to be over, I was going to be overlaid on. And so took a bunch of different photos of places that I might be sitting. Um, and then I went and shot the photo shoot and I sat in us on a stool. I put on a bathrobe um, and, 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 a, and a white bucket hat. I, I, I get, I think I was thinking because if you if you notice, or well, I, I don't know if the, my feet aren't actually in the picture, but I have on um, Jordan Jordan slides as well and white socks. And so, what I guess I was trying to convey was that this 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 character, this is where he lives. He lives in this stoop in this apart in this in this house, and he's going to um, come out of his house and sit on his stoop and just write rhymes. And so that's why I wanted to look super casual. Like this is the place where I live coming out onto the stoop to sit down and write rhymes. And so I got the book, the pen, and I took a whole bunch of different pictures sitting on a, a regular chair, just a regular chair um, with the book, the pen, the hat. And I viewed several different poses, some, some looking at the camera, some not. But ultimately, I settled for one looking away, looking up, because that's kind of how I was looking up on my first album, Take a Look Around, uh, looking up to the higher power, I guess. Okay. For inspiration. Yes. And you also had uh, your wedding band. You were wearing that also. Um, yeah, yeah. Because uh, that's interesting because a lot of artists, some tend to shy away from it. Some really promote it. What was the significance or it was just because that's what you wear? Like, what was that? Yeah, I, I just don't take it off. And um there wasn't even really any thought about it. Like it was like, yeah, this is permanent on my hand. Like this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing. I didn't even think about, I didn't even think people would even notice it or pay attention to it. Um, to be honest, you're the first person that actually mentioned it um, ever. So it was just one of those, you know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't give it a lot of thought. It was, this is what I'm wearing. Um, and people can interpret it however they want. Okay. And then on the back cover, there's like that uh, gate, I guess. And then you have the, the track list and different stuff. And the gate is yeah. locked. Do you remember yeah. why, why you picked that? And is there any symbolism for that? There's no symbolism um, as far as when, when it was shot. Because Francois actually went out on his own and walked around Harlem and took a whole bunch of pictures. Um, there's a there's a there's actually a little boy on the, on the uh, good old love cover. A little I wonder how, kid's probably thirty years old now, forty years old now. Um, but Francois took a picture of him. Um, you know he's just walking around the neighborhood, just just clicking, taking pictures. And so he took a picture of that gate, 
bunch of other stuff, a couple of the housing projects I think are in there too, but most of those visuals are um, from Harlem. And I wanted it to, I wanted to, it to feel like it was Brownsville, like it was Brooklyn. So I wanted it to look as nondescript as possible, even though people that are from Harlem, from that area are gonna know, oh yeah, that's our projects or whatever. But um, he, he, because he was staying up in Harlem, it made the most sense for him to do his scouting and photo taking near where he was staying. So that, that's why we wound up with those, those Harlem shots. Okay. And with the long hot summer, like I would argue all, or at least not, if not all, I would say most, especially your solo material, it's a conceptual album and you have the different sections of the album. Right. As you think of the photos that you guys did use throughout the cover and the, and the album art, did you find a particular section of the album really matched any of the photos that you guys ended up using on the release? I really think only the cover. Um, because like the very first skit is like um, the neighbor, Fats Belvedere, he walks up and he's like, there he is, he's on his stoop, he's writing again. Um, that's probably the most specific to the narrative, the photo that's specific to the narrative. Um, and that was written for that reason, because I kind of knew what the cover was going to be. We had already superimposed me sitting in the chair and the stoop and, and kind of made it work. Um, it didn't look right at first. I will say that it didn't look like I was quite sitting on the stoop. And that's why we sort of, I don't know if it's the right word, but there's like a filter that makes the, the stoop looks kind of like almost like a cartoon. So it's almost like I'm sitting in a, inside of a cartoon. Um, but, you know, the magic of Photoshop, they, you know, it worked, but initially it didn't look like I was sitting on the stoop, it looked like I was floating. So I don't know exactly what the process was for the, for the, um, the, the graphic designer to make it look right, but they, they got it. And I was like, that's it. Okay. And now looking back, what would you say is the, the legacy of a long hot summer's cover for you? What it means for you? Um, interesting. Um, about 10 years after we took that photo, so probably around 2014, uh, we, I seeked out, we were actually trying to shoot a documentary about the, the album, Aloha, I mean, Aloha Summer. And so one of the locations that I wanted to, to find was the actual stoop where we shot it. And I didn't remember, it's 10 years later, I, I honestly, I only remember like what the street kind of looked like. Like I remember what, it was like a park across the street, but I did not know the name of the street or the address. And so I drove up and down Harlem and I was like, that's the block. Cause I remember that there was a park and we turned the corner and then it, then it became, so now we, I'm pretty confident that this is the block. And then we had to kind of walk down, I walked down the block to try to pinpoint which house I thought it was. And I'm looking at the cover and I'm looking at the house and we found it like in the middle of the block. And I'm like, this is the house. And so the, the guys that were there, the, the, the videographer and the photographer, we, we, we sat down to, I sat on the stoop again and took like new photos. It's like whatever I had on that day. So while we're taking photos, the owner of the house comes outside and he's like, can I help you? And it was a little confrontational at first. And um, we were like, oh, no, we were just taking some photos. Um, and I was letting these guys do all the talking because I, I, could, I could look at this man and tell that he was kind of from my school of fuck off my, you know, fuck off my stoop type vibes. So I let, the, I let the, these guys talk to him because they kind of had an accent and, you know, they're from Europe and stuff like that. So I thought he would be a little bit more friendly if he thought that they were kind of some foreigner dudes or whatever. And so the guy, the, the, the guy that was speaking on my behalf was like, oh no, he shot, he shot uh, this historic hip hop cover um, here many years ago. And he's like, when? And it was like, oh, it's 2004. He's like, well, I still own the house in 2004. I don't remember no uh, photo shoot. And they showed him the cover and he's like, yeah, that is my house. And, um, he said, I don't remember getting nothing for this or whatever. And I was like, uh oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, and then so the guys offered him like 
a copy of the record and um, they didn't offer him money or nothing, but it, it seemed like he was kind of going that direction, trying to say if he could somehow collect a royalty for, you know, this photo that was taken off. It, it, it was just an awkward situation. Not that that's the legacy, but um, just a memorable time uh, in, in my career. And, you know, ultimately the guy kind of warmed up and actually started talking to me. I think we took pictures with him and everything. Um, and it wound up being cool and stuff like that, but you know, um, Harlem, I, it, it's a historic place to just be. And I thought it was cool that I even was able to find the actual address after 10 years that not being there or more than 10, it was like closer to 11 or 12 years. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, there it is. Yeah. Well, Master Ace, thanks again for coming through the cover story, Long Hot Summer. If people haven't heard it or looked at the cover in a while, make sure you check it out now. Thanks again, Master Ace. Thanks, man. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.